My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Please, let's open the Bible. To Daniel the book of Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 we are in a treacherous time darkness is threatening to overrun the borders of our habitation there is an urgency in the heart of the father to raise functionaries that can keep the gate. The purpose of church is not just a place where people gather. My heart is broken now. I'm seeing people standing who have no seats. It's as if they had to do away with the seats. Please be here with us. Be here with us. We'll make arrangement from next week. I was told people are standing outside some are standing over fences buildings by next week we will sort it out you know the reason i choose this place is because i want to teach and raise people so i i, I didn't um, intend to begin something bogus just for i wanted to have a, a query site where we dream people but if we can't manage it after three months we will relocate but I assure you, next week we will make arrangements for that. So please bear with us. It won't be like this next week. Meanwhile, we have people coming from far and wide. From next week, we will have an Abuja cruise. So we can manage. Praise the Lord. So we are in a treacherous time. Darkness is threatening. Pastor Steve, you're welcome. It's threatening to erode the purposes of God on the face of the earth. And it happens to be that the way God advances his kingdom is through his functionaries. God is a king. And it will be belittling for God to come to the scene and attempt to advance his agenda himself. If God were to fight, who would he fight with? If God were to war, who would be able, who, who would stand him? If God were to, the Bible said, with a blast of his nostrils, he parted the Red Sea. When Job wanted to bring a case against God, he told him, where were you when I formed the boundary of the ocean? He said, can you command the sweet influences of Pleiades? That means God does not only talk to men, he talks to galaxies. The one we are talking about can speak to a whole galaxy and it will move. Meanwhile, all of us are on one planet. And in one planet, we are in one, on one of the bodies. Eight. And there are nine bodies in this planet. And there are over a hundred million planets. And God can speak to galaxies. So if God wanted to deal with you, what would he say? He's too bogus. And because he's too bogus, what he does is that he decides to crystallize his purpose. Through the people he created, the beings he created. And on the strength of that, they can play out his will. And so, for us to be effective and relevant in the hand of God, we need to know his person. So that we can take matching orders from him. And so when Daniel the prophet peeped into the spirit and he began to alter his oracles. He said, for you to make impact in the agenda of God, there's a prerequisite. The prerequisite for making impact in the agenda of God, he said, is the experiential knowledge of God. The reason is because you didn't come here just to breathe oxygen. 
you came here because there is an agenda that God had in his mind before he began the project of man he had concluded and perfected that agenda and he wanted you to play a role in fulfilling that agenda and so the prophet was speaking and he said for you to participate in that agenda he said you must know him and so he said they that do know their God he said they shall be strong and they shall do exploit that means their life will become consistent with an agenda that predates their existence and the things we are talking about here is before man it's not even an agenda that began with man because what man is coming to do before man was ever created there were spirits that were created in the realm of God because the Bible made us to understand that there was war in heaven there were beings that decided to turn against the policies of God and they said Lucifer he captained a quadrant one third of the angels and he rebelled against God and he said he decided to fight against God but because God is too big he can't fight Lucifer so what God decided to do was to mobilize another angel because as mighty as Lucifer was there were other angels in his keda in the ranks, ranks, of, ranks, of, ranks of God and so Michael showed up and fought him out of heaven and when Lucifer fell into the earth in Revelation chapter 12 from verse 7 he said whoa unto the inhabitants of the earth meanwhile at, this, at that time man had not been created because earth existed before man came but Lucifer's only destination was earth and the moment Lucifer fell on the earth he said woe unto the inhabitants of the earth we don't know the creatures that were on earth at that time he said but the great deceiver has come and you see when God decided to start a new project in order to show the excellency of his power he decided to choose where Lucifer went to and when he chose earth he planted man into the earth and he gave him an insurance policy he said so long as you are lying to my government you will be able to rule above the powers of Hades and above the power of Lucifer. No matter how powerful he was, even though he was a cherubim, I created you in my own image after my likeness. Just walk with me and you will immobilize that cherub. But when man came, he didn't understand that there was wickedness upon the face of the earth. He didn't understand that there was treachery. He didn't hear the stories of the wars of God. If he was wise, maybe he would have read the books of war. Perhaps he would have seen that once upon a time there was a battle between an archangel and another archangel and the territory where he was walking was not a ground of pleasure he didn't know that warriors of eternity had fallen to the earth and there were princes of zion that are now looking for how they will afflict god and the only way they will do it is to look for creatures that god loves and on the strength of their afflicting those creatures they will afflict god the man showed up in a garden and he said this is apple i love apple and then he eats it and he's excited he thought it was about eating and drinking he didn't know that he was in a war zone there was a prince waiting and looking for how to destroy him so when god kept him in the garden the job and the goal or the purpose god had in mind was for him to constantly encounter god and as he encounters god every day he will become more like god and he will play out the script of god so the bible said in the cool of the day the voice of god came walking in the garden he came to educate the man that where you are is a war zone there are princes here there are creatures that want to jeopardize what i'm doing you didn't come here for fun but the man didn't know that encounter was the purpose of the garden because before he stepped out of the garden he needed to be equipped so in Genesis 3 9 the voice of God will come into the garden meanwhile he didn't know what it cost God to come to the garden because this God that comes to the garden is a king in heaven the Bible said day and night the 24 elders they bow they say holy holy so every time God came into the garden what he did was that he removed the garment of divinity he hangs it on the throne and he sneaks out of heaven to look for his obsession the man didn't know that every time God came there was thunder and lightning on the throne but God came because the man needed encounters but he was having fun with fruits he was having fun roaming around the garden calling lions and eagles he didn't know that something was happening kingdom was at war and so he trivialized his encounter with God and decided to know another spirit and when he knew that spirit he became a slave so the parable the prophet was telling us here that they do know they, that do know their god is a strategic information that he gives to us as an insurance policy in war because there is war on earth that 
darkness is trying to overrun the earth and until the purpose of god is established which is born through experiential encounter that cannot happen when you see men worship here and the glory of god descend it's not a good voice it's a function of an encounter because when they sing they dispel darkness when they sing they sound an alarm in the spirit that moves darkness backward because there is another priest that wants to enthrone and establish another government and so what god called us to do is to teach a generation how to walk in the corridors of encounter so that they can win the battles of god because god won't fight you'll be the one to fight on behalf of god you'll be the one to stand in god's quadrant and fight to advance his kingdom but the only way you will do it is to have an encounter i assure you the stories you heard will not suffice when a prince from hades appears when a wicked prince shows up from the bellies of hades the stories they told you will not suffice the things you know about god will not suffice it is what you know in your intimacy with god that will suffice and until you have something on the strength of your intercourse with god you cannot advance his kingdom because this war it comes to kill to steal and to destroy you know when people come before god there are three levels of relationship they enjoy the first level of relationship is to interact with god's benevolence so when you come to god you are a sinner he gives you salvation he gives you eternal life he gives you a gift he gives you everything you look for because the first dimension of god you interact with is his benevolence but with his benevolence you can't advance kingdom you will be a child with his benevolence he can't even commit kingdom to you because every time you show up, oh lord i need bread and wine he said take i'm father so i will do it but when it comes to kingdom you need to grow you need to journey in god and gain strength when it comes to kingdom you need to advance in spiritual stature for him to be able to entrust you that's why he said the heir so long as he's a child he's not different from a servant i can't give him kingdom because kingdom is not for children as a child you can enjoy my benevolence but kingdom is for those who have grown because there is a war and if i don't allow you to grow you will self-destruct because this prince is manipulative they can come and tell you did god say you should not surely eat you didn't know what he was saying it's a parable because he has lived in the realm of god he knows how to deceive only those who have grown by beholding him can fight this battle and so the first realm is the realm of receiving that's why you see so many crowds when we call for miracle service they came to receive when we call for prosperity service you see a crowd they came to receive there are few kingdom functionaries there because when jesus divided bread there were five thousand men but when he went to get so many there were three because there are different levels of relationship there is where you find the crowd where god is interacting on the strength of his benevolence when you journey with god deeper you now come to where you walk with him based on principles you now learn god's principle and you succeed but that's still not enough you can know the whole principle of prosperity but you are not a kingdom agent so in luke chapter 12 verse 16 the man said he gathered his barn and he said oh now my soul will rest for my barn is full and god said you fool that means principle is not enough you need an encounter to find out why you came and what god wants to achieve through your life until you have that encounter even if you are a governor you are a waste even if you are a businessman you are a waste because there is a war that god wants you to fight and the money you have will only become a weapon when you have an encounter with god that's when you will know that ah there's a kingdom to be advanced you will use your mouth for gossip because you don't know the tongue is an instrument of defense in the spirit so when people are watching the gates through tongues you you are gossiping up and down because you think you came here to satisfy your ego you have not known the kingdom you may succeed in what you are doing but god can count on you until a man has an encounter he can't know why he came so he said to jeremiah before you were formed in your mother's womb he said i knew you i ordained you and i sanctified you to be a prophet you didn't come to earth to be creative you came here because something was written about you you were supposed to be my prophet to speak on behalf of me so whatever jeremiah does on earth if he doesn't speak for god his life is a waste because encounter is the only premise by which you can find out why you were born if you don't know why you were born you will be swallowed up in the battles of the age there is a prince that wants to bargain with you he can give you health 
he can give you money because everything God gives he can also give but the purposes of God are born when men begin to have encounters so the first thing God told us to do is to draw men deeper from just that place where they receive from God from just that place where they apply principle to that place where they know him by experience so that the God you know is the God you encounter not the God of Apostle Michael because the God of Apostle Michael may be a God of mercy your own God may be a God of prosperity because our assignment is different Apostle Michael may guide you but you need to encounter him for yourself the God of Apostle Michael may be a God of healing your own God may be a God of war because you are a battle act and may be a different thing so the hope the purpose of gathering which is our 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 vision is to find the people that know God by experience not the people that were told about God not the people that were inviting to take what God gives but the people that journeys into the Holy of Holies and say it is the Shekinah that I'm looking for I know God gives healing I know God gives prosperity but why can't I have him because Abraham journeyed that far he said I am your shield I am your exceeding great reward I can bless because Abraham was rich in cattle in gold and in all precious things but beyond the cattle and gold Abraham knew Elohim he knew El Shaddai and Abraham could call God different names and every name Abraham called God was on the strength of the encounter that he had Abraham didn't call God a name that somebody told him he called God the name that he found because he encountered him in the spirit until every one of us begin to know God the darkness will erode our land the government will not change because even if you pray and change the president if you get there you can't make a difference the only one who can make the difference is the one that have encountered God so when he gets there he knows that this is a platform and this platform is for an assignment until the body of Christ begins to travel in the direction of encounter it will be a waste because most of the people we pray for we are praying for selfish men to go back and still satisfy self only men of encounter can bring a change to our world because the battle is deceptive is treacherous is violent everything you know that wickedness can be used to define is what this battle is about and the only way to survive is by an encounter so god sent us to unveil christ to a generation so that as they see him they begin to have transformations that they didn't learn by reading a book they begin to have transformations that they have because they experienced him until that happens, our coming was in vain. of the different dimensions of Christ so when you see Owen you will see a dimension of Jesus when you see Dulce you will see a dimension of Jesus it will no longer be about how large our congregation is it will be about the dimensions we represent because the dimension we represent will become your spiritual constituency because
just one may come as an intercessor and when he comes into the meeting it doesn't matter if we are five because that meeting may have an intercessor a prophet and an apostle in that three man meeting there is full government at work because the intercessor can bring heaven down the prophet can talk for god and the apostle will carry it to the nations and then you are wondering what is happening because their rank will no longer be in their size their rank will now be in their stature because in the spirit number is not numerical when you hear ten thousand ten thousand is angelic code so a man who has grown in stature to the rank of an angel if two of them gather that's twenty thousand when they say one we chase a thousand two we put ten thousand to fly he's not just talking he's talking about the code in the spirit that there are two kinds of people that when they stand together they are more than a nation because of the stature that they have assumed you will be guarding too but in the spirit they are twenty thousand and then you are wanting what is happening here they have gained a rank in the spirit so when you look at you know the army of israel the army of israel never lost a battle it's not because of their size naturally it's because of the number they represent israel's army in the bible when it was counted was over six hundred thousand people when you study the Torah, the Torah has 300 and something thousand letters. And the Jewish man knows that every letter in the Torah has a spiritual component. So the letter of the Torah is actually 600,000 letters. So when the army of Israel is marching, it's the Torah that is marching. That's why you can't defeat them. So in the spirit, they represent the Torah. It's not just a number, it's a strategy. Because number can mean anything, depending on the rank of the one you are counting. God is looking for men that will encounter him and become like him. Become like him so that he can entrust them with kingdom. Because when these encounters begin to happen, you will now see what will happen. He said, we will grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And if you have studied Christ well in your Bible, you will know that Christ represents three offices. The first office is the office of a son. The second office is the office of a priest. The third office is the office of a prophet. A man who encounters Jesus does not become rich. He may become rich by applying the principles of the kingdom. But a man who encounters Jesus becomes like Jesus. A man who encounters Jesus is not just huge. A man who encounters Jesus becomes like Jesus. And when you become like Jesus, there are threefold manifestations that your life will mirror. Number one is as a son. A son carries government. If you see why God is handicapped in our generation, it's because there are many babes, there are no sons. This does not mean to sound derogatory, but it's the truth. God has a need to send men to different territories, but you can't find them. God wants to send people to government, but if he sends you there, you'll be shocked that your first one week you become a millionaire. And the reason you are a millionaire is that you compromise a thousand times. God is looking for men that will be sent to nations. But most Nigerians, they travel out and they, 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 they get missing. <laughs> they will say, 1,000 people traveled out last year. We only found 300. Where are the 700? They have vanished. Because America is their, is their life. They are hoping to go to America to survive. They don't know kingdom. Sons don't wonder. They travel for inheritance. And so when you see, when you see a son going to America, it's because there's an agenda. You know what? He said, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And he said, what? The government of this world shall be upon his shoulder. So when a son moves forward, his government is advancing. And until God has sons, our world will remain in darkness. The reason we came with the alarm of encounter is because sons must arise. God is not looking for prophets. God is not looking for apostles. He's not looking for evangelists. He's looking for sons. A son can walk in the office of a prophet. A son can walk in the office of an apostle. But until you become a son, you can't bear the government of God. That's why many apostles today are bringing reproach to the name of God. Many prophets today are bringing reproach to the name of God. Because what God is looking for is not a prophet. It's not an apostle. It's a son. And for you to become a son, it's not something you do by resolution. It's a spiritual protocol. It's by beholding Jesus. Because he is the pattern man. It is in him that the dimensions of sonship are revealed. And so the Bible said, we all with open faces, beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord. That's the only time sonship can be in view. You can be born again for 20 years, but until you behold him, you can never be changed. They say, we all with open faces, beholding us.
as in a glass the image of the Lord we have changed the world is metamorphosis so when you see an egg you don't know that that egg has the potential of a butterfly when metamorphosis takes place you will see colors on the wheel where did it come from is metamorphosis if a generation begins to see Jesus suddenly weak men will become sons and when weak men become sons God can give them kingdom that's when you see the lady of 17 years they say I'm going to Zaria and then you say no nobody is going to Zaria I've read the blueprint of my destiny you can see a young boy of 19 years he say I'm going to Canada you say you can't go to Canada when a son speaks keep quiet because he's a, and he's a governmental agent when he speaks the government of heaven will back him up even if there is no way angels will descend to it and they will open the door because you can't stop them they come with government and that's why in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 they say God works some times in diverse manner spoken unto us by the prophet has in this last day spoken unto us by Jesus who being the brightness of his glory the express image of his person and he said something upholding all things that's the beauty of his son by the word of his power when sons emerge God can rest that's why he said children are the heritage of the Lord they said blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them he will not be afraid of the enemy at the gate because when sons come they advance the will of their father and the will of God is government when you see a Christian that doesn't have burdens for the kingdom it's because he's a child when you tell him let's go pray for Abuja let's go pray for Nigeria he will come and snore but he'll be snoring when you say God wants to give a job he will come alive because he thinks of his belly but when sons rise it is burdens that fewer them the more burdens God crystallize, the stronger they become. And then you are wondering what is happening. That's how they survive. They survive by tapping into the economy of the Father's will. And until they fulfill the Father's will, they will never be satisfied. Even when he had to die, mean dying of the cross, Jesus went there. The Bible said he sweated and his sweat was as thick as blood. But the office of sonship necessitates that until the will of the Father is accomplished, he cannot rest. He said, oh, if it were possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. When was the last time you prayed like that? I know you've been in conferences. You have even lived with apostles. But when was the last time you prayed the Father's way? When was the last time it was about what God was looking for? When was the last time you said, not my will, but thine? We are ruled by appetites. And because the prince of this world knows our appetite, any day, any time, he can show up and touch that cord. It's like a remote control. The moment he brings a woman, you are gone. The moment he brings money, you are gone. The moment he brings something palatable, you are gone. You don't know the way of sonship. The star of a son are the many bodies that he pour so that the will of the Father can be accomplished. That's what kingdom is about. And until we get there, our lives will count for nothing. It doesn't matter the number of impartations you receive. It doesn't matter the number of conferences you attend. God is looking for sons. And sons are burden bearers. Until that begins to happen, you have not known the Christ. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, It's not a revival of miracles. Make no mistakes about that. The revival that is coming is not a revival of signs and wonders. It is the emergence of Christ. A generation that walk in the fullness of the stature of the sun will arise. A generation that can go to the gates of the enemy and say, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. And when the devil challenges you, who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong, mighty, he is the King of glory. That's the revival coming. It's a revival of sons. Sons that can bear burden, that even if it has to do with martyrdom, they are willing to die. For me to perish, I will perish. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The revival that is coming is not a revival of open doors for us to travel abroad. The revival that is coming is not a revival that is going to make us famous. The revival that is coming is a revival that will raise sons that can bear the burdens of Abba. How much burdens can you carry? How much burdens? In the area of prayer, 
how much burdens can you carry in the area of finances how much burdens can you carry when god is looking for man will you be counted those are the things that drive us in the last day oh lord if you are looking for one man let me be that man and if it means dying it's an honor those are the men god is looking for make no mistakes he's not moved by number because god knows how numbers work people can be many but they are not relevant but the bible said paul and barnabas he said this be the man that turned their words upside down a thousand priests could not turn their words upside down they sat in the in the in the church as high priest it was a sanhedrin there were scribes and pharisees but there was darkness but two militants rose up and they said we will take the nations for christ and every territory they went to they created an uproar they say what is happening paul and barnabas is there a point came they went to ikonu and they said the same men that caused problem in debi they have come to us because everywhere they go unless they don't find what god is doing even when god is not talking they are searching for bodies paul came into the city the holy ghost didn't talk to him and he went out he was looking for body lord you are saying something about this land i can't sit inside well, what will i be in one place what are you saying and he found somewhere when it was written to the unknown god he found his pathway he came into the, the temple and he said this god that you call the unknown god that's the one i serve sit down let me tell you about him the holy ghost had not spoken but bodies will not let him rest when men are sleeping they stand up at night and then you hear a sound from the other room Coco kaka you say come on people are sleeping what's going on there a song is crying a song is crying when will you deliver abuja when will you deliver nigeria and you think oh people are sleeping you can't hear his door no. you will be wondering what is going on you may call them mad but they are driven by bodies those are the people god is looking for only an encounter will make it happen it's not stories that make such men because sometimes when you begin to pray those bodies you become obscured you may be popular before you started praying maybe your life was in cruise mode until you now started praying for the nations then the princes now hear you say ah who is this bringing this signal they will come and crumble your job if you don't know what matters you will tell god sorry i came to the wrong location you will run back <laughs> you don't know warfare when the prince is here they are certain words you are not permitted to say when you say it they will ask you where did you learn it from those are sacred words that were given as codes to unlock territories how come you know this word that you utter this word you will be in trouble but it's a good kind of trouble because if it will advance the kingdom throw your best shot that's what god is looking for he's looking for sons sons who can bear the burdens of the kingdom and the second thing god is looking for a priest ah. time is a body time is a body time is a body we will crack this city open we will turn this city upside down. Not many days from now, militants will rise. And then you will wonder, where are these ones coming from? They will enter the government. They will enter the market. They will enter the academia. And they will take things. They are not waiting for the kingdom to be handed over. They will take it by force. wasting time they say you need to step on the sea now i've waited for too long strange men will begin to rise men who are not moved by church gathering they are not moved by apostolic gathering they are looking for territories that they will take for jesus because they have become sons they have become sons that's what's about to happen and it's an encounter that we bet it you the one to come 
now do we expect another? I know you are a businessman, but that's a platform. It's not a job you are looking for. You were sent there to take it over. I know you are an academician. It's a platform. I know you are in politics. It's a platform. Because when you get there, God will have a voice. Then you know that songs have been born. The old priesthood have played their part. I came to tell you that a new era is about to emerge. Thank God for their labors. But there's a new sound from Zion. And this sound is not about church congregation. This sound is not about gatherings. Will men continue to gather? Yes. Because the church is the training center of revival. But much more than gathering, a sound is coming from heaven for those who have the capacity to take territories, to take nations. When they read the scripture, my spirit came alive. If they ask of me, I'm not giving you a church. I will give you the hidden for an inheritance. The uttermost part of the earth for your possession. There are men that will take Lagos. There are men that will take Afghanistan. There are men that will take the United Kingdom and they will push back the princes of darkness because we have come. The time is now. The powers of heaven will respond to their voice because they have come to, to bring the business of emancipation. It is for this purpose that we are here. It is for this purpose that we are gathered to sound the shofar that a new season is upon us. We are not moving because we are ambitious. We are moving because a burden drives us. We can no longer be quiet. There is something in our spirit that the Holy Ghost wants to give expression to. The Holy Ghost is looking for access. He wants to find new battle. He can't be caged anymore. Darkness must be caused to move back. But songs must rise. Songs must rise. And you are one of those songs. You cease to be a church member. You cease to be a member of an apostolic center. You will become a citizen of a kingdom. Because you will play your burden, you will play your part, and you will play your mark. He said, until the time of John, the kingdom of God suffered violence. But the violence takes it by force. The time has come for men who will seize kingdoms to rise. Those ones that designation is sons. Want to pray in the Holy Ghost?
in the writing of songs. And the fathers will continue to struggle to will take responsibilities. And so God is sounding another alarm that responsible Christians, responsible songs will begin to emerge. Cities will no longer be left in desolation. And we are waiting for people that we think are established to come there. Some of you will start from your Jerusalem. Some of you will start from where you are. And from there you may cry and your voice will create a reverberation and we will take the city. In the name of Jesus, please sit down. I don't want to paint out this window. We know some of the things we are saying, they are deep matters. Only those who journey in the spirit understand that things are not as they used to be anymore. There are summons taking place in the spirit. Men are being summoned to high places. Designations are already taking place. God is beginning to apportion territory. Why do you think we are coming to our do you, do you think we are coming here because something is happening? We had access to nations. But we are coming here because the battle has been taken to the gates. The battle is being moved to the gates. And so, the same way the apostles migrated from Jerusalem to Antioch, that's why sons are looking for where the sounds are. Because so fast must be sounded from the center of government. Why do you think I came to Khan? You think I don't have better auditoriums? We are coming to the seat of power where spiritual legislation takes place. We know the sounds of the spirit. soon a generation of young people boys and girls will rise and they will do signs and wonders men that can command the constellations to move and we know it's not only for joshua and his generation and that's why god is not only raising sons he's also raising priests the idea of priesthood is to go back to before the foundation of the world and that's why priesthood is intimacy. Priesthood is not just prayer. Priesthood is gaining access to the secrets of the kingdom through intimacy. When the priest in the days of Moses enter the Holy of Holies, what they do is not a ritual. What the priest does is that he goes back to before the foundation of the world and he opens the records. And the record of sin is covered. That's why Israel is forgiven for one year. The priest is carrying out a sacred assignment. He's entering the lexicon of ages past. Finding out where was it said that the man was slain before the foundation of the world. That's where the priest goes to. He finds that lamb in the spirit. I know you are the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Where are the records? That's why the priest journeys from the outer court. He leaves the sun. He enters the inner court. He leaves the menorah and he goes to where the Shekinah himself dwells. He's looking. I heard in the spirit that the man is not going to be slain 2,000 years later. He was slain before the foundation of the world. So he will dig into the archives of heaven and he will find the record. When he finds it, he uses blood to change it. That's what priesthood is. Access to spiritual codes through intimacy. And for that to happen, we must come to a point where our heart posture is re-engineered. Because your prayer is useless until your heart posture has been re-engineered. Because where God alights is not on this altar. Where God alights is the altar of your heart. And so when a man begins a journey of intimacy, something happens. He may be a hard man. He doesn't know how to say sorry. But when he travels deep, sometimes God brings him before the fire of the altar. When that fire begins to burn him, he starts crying like a child. And then you say, what is happening? I thought you were a strong man. There are no strong men there. Because there, you stand only before the Shekinah. And he will choose the dimension he will reveal to you in order to tame the kind of flesh that have made you a slave. Yours may be lost. Yours may be immorality. He will allow you. When the priesthood powers begin to rule you, sometimes he brings you to where the light of heaven dwells. 
and after a while that light will season your soul like an x-ray radiation and it will alter your heart posture until lost we die and suddenly to be said that thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity it's not because you are applying discipline or resolution you have come to where righteousness beams like fire you can't alter you can't say he will break you because it's a journey of intimacy sometimes you will meet the coals of fire and your tongue is sharp and you think you can manipulate things suddenly you will see the seraphims nobody will talk to you you will begin to judge yourself oh woe unto me i'm a man of unclean lips i dwell among unclean people and then they will touch your tongue with the coals of fire when that man returns he will not only be giving word of knowledge but it is from that point that he will say unto us a child is born because his tongue has been re-engineered the heart posture has been re-engineered government can now begin if priests don't rise the kingdom will not move i know there's a prayer movement coming don't be among those who bastardizes because it's not about a show of prayer it's about joining into depths where your heart can be engineer they will say to ezekiel they say i've taken from you the heart of stone and i've put there the heart of flesh that's what priesthood is about that your heart will become an altar and day and night the holy ghost can alight upon you it is when the holy ghost alight that legislation begins because you don't do legislation with your head the princes you are dealing with they are ancients the Bible said Lucifer walked to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. He wasn't born yesterday. He knows your great grandfather. He knows your grandfather. Hope you know the Bible said Abraham loved fair women. Isaac loved fair women. Jacob also loved fair women. There is a record in your ancestry. They have all of it. And so when they come to fight you and you want to use your mind, you are defeated before you started. You must align until the Holy Ghost descend. He will be the one to tell you, wake up by 12. Go out of the compound and give God thanks. It's a code. If you like, come and make it a doctrine. One thousand people will do it. It will not work. Because the battle of your father's house is different from that of another. You will need a different strategy to work it. Because what God wants to do is not to answer prayers. He wants to teach you the ways of the spirit. So in the journey of peace too, we find the God that dwells in secret. But I tell you, there are too many Christians who can't find God. You know, he said, my sheep hear my voice. And they obey me you don't know the implication of that statement if you don't hear his voice now when the rapture takes place you may not hear because it's the same way he speaks to you now that he will speak at the rapture he won't say it audibly it's the way he says it spiritually that he will still say it there that's why not everybody will hear because god is expecting that if you say you are his sheep you would have journeyed with him enough to be able to pick his frequencies but there are too many Christians who don't know the frequency of God. When they want to marry, they do Timini Tanana. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? You are doomed. It's because there's no priesthood. We have offices and titles in church, but we can't hear God because we have not tarried enough. You know, when Moses began to learn the way of priesthood, sometimes it took him 40 days to climb Sinai. And when he has climbed Sinai, you would think he will meet God. He will still wait for six days. It is when he tarries there. That his soul will crack and when his soul crack then the king descends and then he will tell him go and speak to the rock and water will come there's no water in the desert but when the king says talk to the rock water will come out from there if he lives there and you come and talk to the rock nothing will happen because he has a backing from intimacy a generation that knows god so deep needs to be born in exodus chapter 20 verse 21 he said moses stepped into the deep darkness where god was even when god hid himself his priesthood and stature he could find god how come we cannot find god in common and simple life situation because there's no priesthood meanwhile we brag of titus we brag of number but we don't have men that can pick the frequencies of heaven a new generation must rise there are things that are bigger than miracles there are things that makes you eternally relevant when you know these things god will now consult with you to carry out kingdom legislation he said will i do a thing and not reveal it to my servant how can the god of heaven consult with a man before doing something it is where they commune it's a function of the depth where they commune so even god even though god is not obligated to abraham intimacy won't let him so any news in the heart of god he wants to share it because Abraham is always around 
that corridor people need to rise that are around the corridors they stay there in the morning they stay there in the afternoon they stay there in the night even though they are businessmen in their office they know what to say sometimes when they even speak in tongue they are exhaling because the holy ghost just passed and they picked him and they give expression and then you are wondering say what is happening is priesthood taking place priest must rise we came to show a generation the way of priesthood by the methods of god and by the instrumentality of grace and finally is to wield the scepter of kingship when these three things begin to happen and press for time then we'll begin to lock the soulish gates do you know why we are weak we don't have men that have locked the gates of the soul and so because we cannot do without sin we now introduce a doctrine of righteousness that righteousness is only a nature because the gate a gate is open and we can't close it so when we say righteousness is only a nature even when you sin with pastor pastor will tell you forget we are righteous but he said in first john chapter 3 verse 7 he said little children let no man deceive you him that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous righteousness is not the only a nature is a lifestyle it is in the lifestyle of righteousness that god is glorified in the nature of righteousness the fatherhood of god is revealed but in the lifestyle of righteousness god is glorified the only way god can be glorified in your life is when you live out righteously but when gates are open in our soul we will look for a way to be comfortable in sin and we'll look for a doctrine to cover it when our soul is porous our goal and focus will be things and so we can no longer give to God. We will can all we can and we will keep it for ourselves. Because gates are open. When sons rise, when priests rise, and when kings rise, a generation that is ready to advance the kingdom is born. And you are a part of that generation. We came to announce to you that a new order of Christianity has come to earth. We are not the one bringing it but we have heard the sound and so we have aligned with it that men that pray we rise men that give we rise men that fast we rise men that live righteously not just as a nature but as a lifestyle we rise men that fear the lord we rise men that honor one another we rise the time when the church is so divided because of envy and selfishness is over because this generation god is giving birth to we will love ourselves as though we are obsessed and so the devil can't find any porous entity everyone will be humble and we walk in love and so even though you are offended you will go and make peace you will not go and backbite because we know that unity is not just a function of whether i like or i don't like unity is our set time in the spirit for where two or three are gathered together in my name i am there in the midst of them it's a complete generation and there are many more that we rise because our emergence is a parable to a generation that many more generations many more voices we rise suddenly you will find young men of 18 young men of 19 young men of 20 doing mighty things and you ask yourself how they will tell you is the hand of god they say for the hand of god was upon elijah and he outran the chariots of Eha, even unto jesse you will see women doing great things and you say why how is this possible is the hand of god a generation have emerged and on the shoulders of that generation the governments of the age can be placed this is why you were summoned the goal of this holy convergence is because god is calling a generation a generation that he wants to trust a generation he wants to hand kingdom to not just a generation that's seeking for what he has to offer but a generation that wants to do his will a generation that wants to bear his body and say lord what is my part i want to play it we may show up excellent because it's necessary but in our spirit we are rugged because what we came to do is to fight is to fight to defend the will of god and to proclaim his government over a generation bow your heads and pray it's a solemn moment it's a solemn moment 
You are going to tell the Lord you are ready. Because from tonight, God will cons conscript functionaries. I know you've been a Christian for long. But tonight, God will conscript functionaries. I know some of us are even ministers. But it's beyond preaching a good sermon. It's the man that God can trust. Commitments will be made. Because the day is upon us. for most times are the additions we don't just know that when we give our all to God God will give his all back to us we don't know what God is looking for it's the totality of our hearts and so tonight there's a song just in case you want to rededicate yourself to the Lord not the religious one now and say Lord use me for your glory place your hands on your chest For those of you in the city of Abuja, we will have, have time to dig into the world. I just came to cast the body. But there is so much more God wants to do. If your hand is on your chest, stand up. If you are not sure, you can still sit down. magnify your name. We exalt you. We love you. We honor you. We ask that tonight you open us up to your oracles and pour of your spirit upon us. Grant us access to dimensions eternal and empower us even for the work of the kingdom in the last days. Take all the praise. Take all the glory. In Jesus precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Tonight I want to share something very important. Important because number one, without it, we cannot do the business of the kingdom. And number two, important because there is a caution that we need to draw our attention to because the devil is outrightly attacking this operation of the spirit. And if we don't pay attention to it, a generation will be robbed. Of inheritance, a generation will be, be robbed of authority and power to advancing the kingdom of God. This is the gathering of eagles, and we are not eagles except as we are enabled. We are not eagles except as we are empowered. 
And so tonight I want to talk to us about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And trusting the Lord because of the delicate emphasis I want to bring to help me remain calm for a long period of time to explain some of these things. People are excited, people are shouting, people are being slain, but the manifestations, attendant manifestations of the anointing that we saw in scriptures and that we saw in the life of the fathers of old is gradually seeping out of our experience and of our gathering. And if we don't pay attention to these things and examine them carefully, a time will come where we will only be excited, we will only be psychological, but the things that the anointings do, we will no longer find them in our midst. This is why this subject is very important, and this is why I want to advance it from the perspective from which I'm advancing it tonight. Praise the Lord. We are becoming naked people. Trying to cover up for our nakedness with a lot of psychology and a lot of emotions. That will not suffice. So long as the blind is not seeing, the deaf is not hearing, the lame is not walking, the power of the Holy Ghost is not pushing the tides of darkness backward. Everything we are doing is religion. And for us to make demand on the same dimension of the anointings that the fathers of old handled. There are certain coordinates of scriptures we must pay attention to. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 12, Paul said, I demonstrated before you all the signs of an apostle. Every man who is sent, there are signs, there are emphasis. In Mark 16 verse 20, the Bible said they went out and the Lord walking with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. In Acts 14 verse 3, it said, long time abode day, speaking boldly in the Lord. The Lord confirming the words of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, it said, when they were gathered together, the place where they were was shaken. And it said, they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. And it said, the Lord stretched forth his hands walking among them signs and wonders. And he said, great grace was upon them. These guys were not psychological people. These guys were not emotional people. There were signs that were verifiable. There were wonders that drew the attention of people to the Lord Jesus. And if the gospel must be preached accurately in our day and time, then the subject of the anointing must be understood. Not from an emotional perspective, but from an accurate scriptural context. You don't have to be excited for the anointing to walk. You don't have to be in church, in a conference for the anointing to move. In the days of the apostles of old, the wonders they wrought were in marketplaces. The wonders they wrought were in territories where they were criticized. The wonders they wrought was without keyboards. The wonders they wrought were in dark territories. And the testimony of their ministries were backed up with impossible things that God did through them. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1, he said, when I came unto you, I did not come with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, I came with the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith may not be built in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our generation is gradually replacing the tangible power of the Holy Spirit with psychology and with emotion. And because most of our gatherings are filled with young people who are excited, we confuse ourselves to think is the power of God. When you become 50, you will wake up. Adrenaline and hormones will go down. You will understand that the gospel is not a trick. It's a reality that was handled by the first fathers. And if you don't handle it, you don't have it. And when that time comes, if you don't have it, darkness will make a mess of you. This is why we need to re-examine the scripture to find out the tenets of the anointing. And begin to commit ourselves to it as quick as possible. Because if there is any time we need the power of the Holy Spirit, that time is now. Ah, ah, ah. ah, ah, ah. Ah, 
Tonight, I want to shut down emotions and get us facts of scriptures. Most times when I come for meetings, the intensity is so much that we can't even share God's word. There are three things I'll be advancing tonight on the subject of receiving the anointing. Because that's what I want to talk about tonight. Thank you so much. God bless you. You can sit down. Celebrate them. And so the three things I'll talk about is number one, who anoints men? Number two, what is the anointing meant for? And then number three, how do you receive the anointing? Please pay attention. Please, I beg you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is most graphically defined in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. The Bible said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with, with, he gave us the substance of the anointing. When we say the anointing, what is it made up of? So he said God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. So the anointing is made up of two things. Number one is the person of the Holy Spirit. And number two is the attributes of the Holy Spirit. In that scripture, he picked power. But there are many attributes of the Holy Spirit. This is why the anointing is not just a force. The anointing is first of all a person. And the force, the life force that comes out of that person. The anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit and the attributes of the Holy Spirit. He said God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. With the Holy Ghost and with power. In the Old Testament, men who were anointed, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And the fragrances of his attributes flowed through them. In the New Testament, however, the Holy Ghost does not just come upon us. The Holy Ghost, first of all, came within us and then he comes upon us. But over and above the operation of the Holy Spirit, it's important for you to know that he is the person and the attributes. It could be power, it could be wisdom, it could be favor, whatever attribute that flows through you per time. Is part of the component of the anointing. It's important for you to understand this definition so you will know who anoints men. If you don't understand this definition, you will mistake the person of the anointing for a teen and because you mistake the person of the anointing for a teen, you will misunderstand who actually anoints men. And if you don't know who anoints men, you will do a lot of crazy things thinking you'll be anointed in the process you may meet a demon. A lot of people have done things and they collided with demons and their lives were wrecked. And they didn't know why it happened that way. It's because they didn't know what the anointing was about. And so the anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit and the attributes of the Holy Spirit. Now, having understood this, who has the power to impart the Holy Spirit? You now discover only one person anoints. And the one who anoints is God. It's God that anoints men. In this same scripture, you see what the Bible said. It said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Only God anoints men. If you study Numbers chapter 17 verse 11, Moses was counseled by his father-in-law. To get elders who will support him in bearing the bodies that he bore daily. And God came to corroborate it. But God made us understand that bearing the bodies of God is not just a mental thing. There are many people today who have studied. And they think because of their mental power, they can bear the bodies of God. 
There are many people today who have seen problems in the body of Christ. And because they are educated and can speak English, they want to be a spiritual body by mental power. And then you'll find them sitting everywhere trying to correct the body of Christ. Try to teach the body of Christ what to do because they can gather facts and analyze it. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to do a spiritual business. And so even after Jethro counseled Moses, it would not work that way. When God showed up, God said in Numbers 17 verse 11, he said, ordain 70 elders. He said, I will take of the spirit that is upon you and place upon them. Two things you find in that scripture is number one, you cannot help God carry out the business of God with your mental power. No matter how intelligent you are, no matter how burdened you are, no matter the facts you gather, you don't have the competence to do a spiritual business with mental power. Your prowess means nothing when spirits are involved. You may start where? Wait until a demon intercepts you. You will discover how weak and vulnerable you are. That same thing you are advancing, a point will come, you will become the architect that fights it. You will not know. A lot of people stand up, they try to accuse men that they are immoral. Pastors are immoral. Elders are immoral. After a few weeks, a demon gives them influence. The same immorality they are fighting, they begin to do it. Many come and accuse pastors that they are swindling money from people. And because they are, they are attacking spiritual men, people support them, clap hands for them. After one year, a point come, that business become a business of swindling. And they don't know how they got there. Mental power is not sufficient in carrying out spiritual business. And so even though the counsel of Jethro was correct, God didn't endorse it. What God did was to do it by the spirit. And the second thing you see from that scripture is that a man can anoint a man. The spirit was upon Moses. But God said, I will be the one to take that spirit and put upon the elders. This is why a man who lays hands on somebody and he becomes anointed will be praying to God about his son for 10 years. Nothing happens. If he had his way, he would have laid that same hands on his son and nothing will happen. You'll find a man who will have 200 pastors. Two of them are picked of God and are being used. And the other 198, no matter what he does, they are not anointed. It is therefore futility to show up as a man and boast that you made somebody. No man can make another man. Only God makes men. Because if you claim you make men, you should be able to make everybody under you. How come it's one and two or three people only who are made? It means that is fallacy. You don't even know what you are talking about. Only God makes men. He said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. He said, let us make man in our own image. Only God makes men. So it's God who anoints. Even though the grace is upon you. If God doesn't take that grace and put on another. Forget about it. You cannot make any difference about it. If you understand that only God anoints men. When you begin the journey of the anointing. You will not trace a man. You will find God. If you know that it's only God who makes men, when you start seeking the anointing, you will not compromise the standards of God. You will keep the standards of God. Because if you violate it, you have already exonerated yourself from the process. This is why the sorcerer came to Peter to give him money and say, give me this power that you have. He said, your money perish with you. To think you can buy the gift of God with money. If you violate the standard of God, you have already compromised the process. You can never be anointed. Please sit down. You run! You run! You run! You run! Kadosh! You are mighty on your throne. You run, you run, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. God is the only one who anoints men. However, they are mediums. You know, when you say things like this, people get excited. Because when they hear you say things like this, they now want to begin to attack men. 
they think you are pitching your tent against other men of God. They don't know it's the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm taking time to follow this route to help somebody because we are in the media generation. You will go and find godly good things on the internet. It will rob you. It will rob you. It will rob you. See, many genuine people can't make progress because they hurt the wrong people. Men who are not custodians. What they wanting to correct and talk to the body of Christ because they have facts. Listen, if somebody is wrong, condemn him for his error. But don't try to talk about eternal principles. These are landmarks. You don't know what they contain. You don't know them. If a man sins, say he has sinned. But don't drag that man into the principles of the kingdom. You don't know it. You don't know it. Only God anoints men. But there are mediums. And I'll talk about two mediums that God uses when he anoints men. Number one is through encounters. When God genuinely wants to anoint a man, he will encounter that man. Read the scriptures. It is replete. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses had a body to deliver Israel. Great body. In fact, he went as far as killing an Egyptian. But he didn't give him the power required until God encountered him at the backside of the desert. Even in Horeb, the mountain of God. And suddenly, Moses returned. The rod of Moses became the rod of God. When a man encounters God, something rubs off on him. It is natural. Because God comes with an energy. God comes with an atmosphere. If he meets you, when you leave, there will be a signature. And the more you meet God, the stronger the grace on your life becomes. Because the Moses who met God on Horeb didn't just meet him once. In Exodus 33 verse 29 and 30, Moses came down from Sinai. And the Bible said the face of Moses was shining. The oil was becoming thicker. So the more a man encounters God, the more anointed he becomes. And you can encounter God through an open vision. You can encounter God through his word. You can encounter God through the transmissions of the spirit of of God. God can choose to carry you to a place in the spirit. And different things can happen. But whichever way, you are not anointed until you have encountered God. If you have not encountered God, you try your spirit. Or check the potency of what you say you carry. Don't just pray for people in church. Go to the market and pray for people too. And when you pray, find out the testimonies that come from it. You will discover that you may come to a place people respond because they have been taught the cliche. That's why in our generation today, people fall under the power only in church. How many times have you seen people fall under the power in the market? How many times have you changed geographical location? And you found people falling under the power. People fall under the power in Nigeria. Go and try it in UK. Because they don't have that orientation. And so the anointing is beyond an emotional expression. The anointing has to be tangible. It has to lead to transformation. And it has to lead to tangible change. That can be verified. Certain other things are variables. If you have not encountered God. You can't be sure that you have been anointed. And if you think you are, what you do in Enugu, be able to do it in Kano. Be able to do it in Meduguri. Be able to do it in Afghanistan. Be able to do it in United Kingdom. Be able to do it in Ghana. If you can't replicate it in different places, you are just working with people who have been psychologically brainwashed. That's not an anointing. But if you truly encounter God, what you carry will defy territory. Anywhere you go, you will replicate it in higher intensity. It will not be regulated by territory. I'm not talking about a situation of unbelief. When people walk in unbelief, they can stiffen the anointing. But I'm talking about a situation where the people have heard the gospel, their heart is open. But because they are not oriented in a certain way, they can't replicate the dimension. If you find such things, know that what they are dealing with is fallacy. This is why our generation must encounter God. Because God wants to send men. What you are doing in Enugu will not end in Enugu. God needs a man in Canada. God needs a man in Kenya. God needs a man in Zambia. God needs a man in, in Afghanistan. And what if he sends you? This thing you are doing, are you sure you will be able to replicate it outside the context of Enugu? This is why beyond what we see, we must seek to encounter God. 
Because until we encounter God, we don't carry what God has. The second medium through which God anoints men is through men. And I will take time to speak about this when I begin to talk on how to receive the anointing. Many people, there's a move rising now on the internet. What is that move about? They want to discredit the possibility that a man carries something with God and he can commit it. They want to bring rebellion to the heart of the younger generation and bring them to a point where they no longer honor fathers and authorities. And so when you start honoring fathers, they say you are trying to gain relevance through association. If relevance by association is what makes men voices in the body of Christ, why not try it? Why not start calling the names of people and see if that will make you a voice? Do you know what it means for men to sit down to hear a man to in the spirit? We are in a, in a fast generation. For a man to sit down for 30 minutes and hear you. You think it's just by calling the name of another man that somebody will shut down his life and sit down by data to listen to you. Not for one week, not for one month, not for one year, not for two years. You are joking. You don't know what is going on. When God exhausts the horn of men, know that they have something with God. And when God wants to anoint people, many times he routes them to other men. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, from verse 5 to 4, 4 to 5, Paul met Jesus in his glory. The glorified Christ appeared to Paul. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. In case you will say it was an angel, he introduced himself. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And Paul said, what will you have me do? I thought Jesus would tell him, go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Jesus said, rise up, go into the city, you'll be told what to do. How can a man meet the glorified Christ and he refers him to another man? I thought you said the gospel is only about Jesus. I thought you said we are preaching men. Is Jesus too preaching men? How can a man meet Jesus in his glory? Not the Jesus that before resurrection. The Jesus after resurrection. The Jesus after ascension. The Jesus after glorification. Met Paul and said, go into the city. You'll be told what to do. And Paul will go into the city and wait for three days. Because Jesus is still deliberating with that man to agree. Why didn't Jesus go to another man? And he said, go and meet this man. He is praying. And the man will say, no, I've heard the record of this guy. That he has vexed your church. He has killed many. He has arrested many. Why will I do this? And Jesus will be negotiating with the man. To go and anoint him. And then somebody wakes up today and say That you are not preaching Christ. Is Jesus preaching men? You see where error is creeping into the body of Christ. And gullible people who don't discern. We hear funny things, fables, and they will be led astray. Ananias will agree and come to Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, he puts his hand on him and says, Brother Saul, receive the Holy Spirit. The Jesus who appeared to you on the road sent me to you. Now rise up. And Ananias will anoint Paul after Paul met Jesus from heaven. Why didn't Jesus impart him with the Holy Spirit? Why didn't Jesus put the anointing upon him? He will send him to another man. The man will be reluctant. Jesus will persuade him to go and meet Paul. And he will show up and lay hands on Paul for Paul to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we are not careful, we will be a naked generation. Hey, 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 in first Samuel chapter 16 verse 13 God will want to raise a king after Israel asked for a king and he had made up his mind already to anoint David 
And God may send Samuel and say, go to the house of Jesse and anoint his son as king. Why won't God just anoint him? And Samuel will come attempting to anoint Eliab and God will quickly say, stop. Because if that oil rests on his head, he's anointed. Stop! I have not chosen him. He said, man, look at the outward. I check the heart. Wait! And the guy will sit down. They will bring one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sons. And God will reject all of them until they will bring David. And Samuel will pour the oil on David. And the Bible will say, from that day, the Spirit of God rested upon David. Why wouldn't God send the Spirit on David? I'm telling you why we are powerless with all our revelation. We have dishonored custodians. And a generation is being mentored to continually dishonor them. Only God anoints men. But there are mediums through which God does that. It could be through an encounter. It could be through the medium of other men. That's why the Bible said in Hebrews 6.12, it says, follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. Follow them. Follow them. It's an admonition of scriptures. Follow them. What we are doing is highly spiritual. It's not a joke. This is real. Life and death depends on it. Men will die and men will survive because men carry anointings. And if those anointings are gone, a generation might be lost. Because in the day of trouble, English language will not suffice. In the day of war, grammar will not suffice. In the day when spirits show up from darkness, facts will not be enough. You will need men that have a walk with God. Men that have things to show, to rise up and speak on behalf of the body of Christ. Study the scripture. It's replete. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 to 17, God wanted to anoint kings and prophets. And the same Elijah that God was rejecting. You know, when you start talking these things, they try to pick the errors of men. Listen, we know some of these fathers are not perfect. We know. But we don't honor them because they are perfect. Do you honor your biological father because he's perfect? Are you not a hypocrite? When was the last time you rose up publicly to assault your biological father with all the error and garbage he carries? But when it comes to a spiritual context, they want to rubbish men that have a walk with God for years. You know how many souls this man won? You know how many warriors they built for God? You know how many times they endangered their lives? As small as I am here, I can tell you how many times I've passed through death because of this kingdom. Just two weeks ago, I left Abuja to Kaduna around 3.15 p.m. because I needed to be there. Even the military guys that work with me said, it's too late. That journey will take 2 hours 40 minutes. And so you may be on that road by 6 p.m. That's when bandits attack. But the Holy Ghost will not let me. You will go for this meeting. As small as I am. And then you talk about a man that has served God for 40 years, for 50 years. Do you know how many times he has risked his life? Why not leave your studio and go and preach the gospel in Gombe once? Why not leave your studio and go to Meduguri and win five souls? Then come back and tell us about serving God. Leave your studio. That place where you hide without an identity. Go to the streets of Pakistan. If you are able to say Jesus is Lord. You think it's to sit behind a studio and preach to people online? What do you know about serving God? What do you know about truth? What do you know about integrity? 
We are not saying people are not wrong, but shut up. Don't try to dismantle things that are eternal. Do you know the kingdom of God? You just, oh man. I say these things with a body because a generation is about to lose an inheritance. Some of the things we carry, they are handed over. Because men are custodians. The anointing on Elijah does not belong to Elijah. It belongs to generations. And so a point come, Elijah can't go to heaven with it. Even though Elijah wanted to go to heaven, he fell. He didn't give it. He fell. Because it doesn't belong to him. And if you don't know that these things are handed over, you will be preaching your revelation, trying to please men. And in the day of battle, you will discover you are naked. Do you know when they call people? Those who are ministers, ask those who reach them. It's around 12 midnight to 2 a.m. That people are calling you. When you pick, you say, we know this is the time we will reach you. And sometimes it's not even an emergency. Somebody calls you 1 a.m., you pick. He say, I had a dream. Because the anointing puts a responsibility on you. You can't be angry. Because if you are, the Holy Ghost will be angry with you. And then you think it's by researching one or two mistakes on Facebook and sit down to talk. Do you know the kingdom? When God chose Elisha, even though Elisha was God's man, God came and told Elijah, remember, Elijah had been rejected. God had rejected him. And God told him, go and anoint Elisha as prophet in your stead. I have rejected you, but there is something on you that I can't deny. I put it there. And before you leave, somebody else must collect it. And God will command Elijah to go and anoint Elijah because God doesn't have need for him anymore. And then you sit down, you think that because somebody made an error, they should crucify him. Do you know what God kept on him? Do you know what God hid in that man? We don't validate their mistakes. And we don't encourage anybody to learn from it. Remember, the men we follow, we don't only learn their good. God allows us to follow them to also learn their mistakes so that we can be better. So we are conscious of their error. But we also know that there is something they carry. And that thing they carry, we must receive it. This is not human worship. When you honor your father, you are not worshiping him. Except in your own training and where you come from, honor is worship. When you honor your father, when you greet your father, are you worshiping him? You hear garbage and you are wondering where do the, where are these people come like this come? Then you will discover that we are helpless. You think God who left them there is not wise? You think God who left them there did not see their mistakes? When you take them out, who can stand to say restore? Who can stand? The crisis we are going through in Nigeria. Why do you think certain things and certain thresholds have not been crossed? It's because there are certain men they know because they are present. There are things they cannot do. And then you come, you say they made this mistake. You crucify them. If those men leave, can you stay in your, in your, in your state and call the name of Jesus? You don't know what people carry. And then we glorify those who have died and those who are alive, we crucify them. This is why a generation is not being anointed. Because we can't discern the vessels who carry it. How many people have encounters? If I took a census here now, how many of you have had encounters before? You'll be shocked that out of 100, maybe only 5 have had encounters. If God anoints only by encounters, how many will be anointed? Do you know the price you pay to be encountered? There are laws that govern encounter. One of the laws that governs encounter is Total, total, total search for God. 
for him with all your heart. How many men here can suck for God? If God said we anoint only how many will be anointed? This is why he creates other channels apart from encounters to anoint men. Because he knows we are growing. Please sit down. Yeah, yeah. Ah, ah, ah. I started talking in this direction. Maybe I begin from this one. It's by honor. This would have been the last. But I've doubled into it already. You, and you receive the anointing by honoring the vessels that carry it. You dishonor them. God can never use them to anoint you. Because it's a law in the spirit. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 7. It says without every contradiction. He said the less is blessed of the better. It's a law. If you don't honor a man. Even your heart can't open to receive from that man. No matter how you try. This is why we teach the culture of honor. Because the culture of honor helps you to open your heart to receive. And if your heart is not open, you can never be anointed. In Genesis 27, from verse 7 to 9, Joseph wanted to transfer the inheritance to his son. And he said, get for me a savory venison. Let me eat that my soul may bless you. They knew the strategy. They knew the principle. They knew the order of transference. Show me honor. My soul can open to bless you. I know you are the one God has chosen. I know God has ordained you. I know God will take the spirit upon me and put on you. But show me honor. Let my soul connect to your soul. If you don't honor me, my soul can't connect to you. These are patriarchs of old. They knew the landmarks. They found it in the spirit. And they know that these things can never be denied. When a man of God we find a generation fighting every servant of God. Be careful. It's a strategy of the devil. There are three things the devil achieves when he does that. Number one, he blocks the channel of inheritance. You will see a generation rise with so much revelation, but they cannot see the attendant manifestation. We will teach power it will be more intelligent than all the fathers put together. The fathers with their little revelation, we see power, we may not see it. Meanwhile, we will teach power better than them, but we will not see power. We will teach all the doctrines of healing. You will never see one witch here in our meeting that is raised. All our anointing ends with people falling under the power. The fathers will show up and just talk for five minutes. And ten which years will be empty. Does it not suggest to you something is wrong? Because there is a truncation in inheritance. Your own biological father. Do you dishonor them to receive their inheritance? Who told you you would do it in the spirit and it will work? We don't teach the culture of honor to deify men. The Bible said to raise men not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You honor men because you have been trained to discern. And a mature believer knows the difference between honor and worship. Even God himself, in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 1 and 2, he say, honor your father in the Lord. And he say, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long. That means if I want to keep you on earth for long, you may make it difficult for me if you dishonor your biological parents. As powerful and as sovereign as I am, I may not be able to keep you for earth for on earth for long if you dishonor your parents. So in case you want to live long, better be careful to honor your parents. That is God talking. And then you find people show up 
trying to disconnect a generation from an inheritance. Listen, there is a witness that is with someone that needs to rest on you. There is an authority that is with someone. God has chosen you for that authority. Don't allow discernment, uh, allow dishonor, shut down your discernment so that you will see that person and you will not connect and receive. I know these things have been abused. People have become irresponsible in the name of tapping from one another. I know it has been abused. But if somebody abuses a reality, correct the person and don't pull down a principle. The principle is older than you. And if our generation is not taught, we will end up with emotions and psychology. This is why this is the only generation people pride themselves in prayer. Now, when men are talking, it's prayer. Prayer power, prayer time, prayer posture. Prayer was normal in the days of the fathers. Everybody prayed. Nobody came to say his record of prayer. But when you pray, they check you. Is there brokenness? Is there power? Is there authority? Is the byproduct of prayer they look out for? But our generation is so naked because we don't have anything to show. We have to make a show of flesh. And people pride themselves that they are prayer champions. Nobody cares how long you can pray. It's what your prayer can produce that people look out for. They say, as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. It's not your traveling we are looking for. It's the children of your travail we are looking for. But it's our helplessness before situations that makes us to begin to drive and pride ourselves in the things that our youthful energy can generate. All this your prayer posture and prayer movement. If you are 60, will you operate like that? It's youthfulness. That's not authority. I'm telling you, error is creeping in gradually. Today, people call authority a wet suit. And so when we pray, we want to appear on the internet with wet suit. So that people will see how wet. My suit is already wet. This is not authority. If there's authority, when I finish, I'll pray for these people who will walk. If not, this sweat is nonsense. If this is not the authority. The sweat is not the authority. You can put it on Facebook. People can shout and call your name. You can even hug the puppet while praying. That's childishness. It's not the travail of Zion men are looking for. It's the offspring of Zion. When we are naked, we start looking for things to cover up. And one of the reasons we are naked is because of dishonor. We don't know how to receive inheritances. We don't know. Number two, this error they are peddling that they don't know. By the time our generation successfully disconnects from fathers and begin to dishonor them, we will become rebels. You will find a lawless generation where nobody can correct anybody. I showed up from Pakistan with exploits of faith and I sat on the internet and spoke about my experiences. Everybody was clapping. My father-in-law called me and said, you have heard. He said, this thing you said, this thing you said, this thing is not for public consumption. Which other person would tell me that? Every other person was clapping. My God, you went to an Islamic nation. Jesus, this is an apostle of God. When an old man zoomed in carefully, he said, no, you shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said this. I took dressing. When there are no men who have authority over a generation, they may be very anointed, but they will equally be lawless and rebels. And at the end of the day, they will make more harvest for the devil than they will ever make for Jesus. Before when I'm preaching, for the first one hour, all I'll be saying will be mysteries. But, he doesn't call me apostle. He say, Michael, how are you? <laughs> if he call, Michael, how are you? Where are you? No, but which apostle what? <laughs> when did you? How are you? He sat me down and said, number one, keep the message simple. Keep the message 
simple. It's called the gospel. It's good news. When you have an encounter, discuss it with those who have those encounters with you. When you come out to preach to the body of Christ, they should understand what you are saying and be transformed. He said, number two, do away with pride. People see me, they say, fire, fire. In the fire, he saw arrogance. Do away with the pride. Don't be arrogant. Pride, go ahead before you fall. Number three, don't, don't, don't destroy yourself. You don't know the God that placed men over men is wiser than you. There was no anointing there. It was instructions and commandments. He said, no matter what men do to you, never be bitter. He said, when you are bitter, stop preaching. Your priesthood is corrupt. Go and wait on the Lord and put your heart. And he said, never do to people the way they did to you. Do to them as God has commanded you. And then you want us to stand up tomorrow and begin to talk that we too have become wise. When you say these things, they claim that you are trying to exalt men or you are trying to gain relevance by association. Do they know what these things are in the kingdom? Paul, the great apostle, in Galatians chapter 2, he said, I went to Jerusalem by revelation. And he said, I went to meet Peter and the disciples so that I would not have run my race in vain. This is the same Paul that said, the gospel I preach, no man taught me. I received it from the Lord. Why will he now say he's going to Peter? Was he trying to gain relevance? He knows that the elderly generation, the younger generation will end up as rebels and lawless men. If you find a generation, a person or a people that nobody can instruct them and they are not accountable to anybody, run for your life. When a generation becomes wise, they look for authorities deliberately to submit to. There are certain contexts when those authorities are men. And there are certain contexts where those authorities are laws that govern systems. For example, if you go to the Catholic setting, if you go to the Methodist setting, they may not have men as symbol of authority, but they have laws that govern them. They have presbyteries. If you come to the Pentecostal setting, they have men. Whichever way you find yourself, make sure you're under authority. Don't let anybody talk you into dishonor. There is no inheritance attached to it. This is why you can pray for 40 days and yet not be anointed. Because God will be afraid of committing power to you. You are without a checker. You are without authority. Without a law over your soul. If you can speak and you are not afraid that somebody can call you and say what is the meaning of this, then you are in error. There's problem. Wait until it manifests. You will be shocked the level of error you will pioneer. In fact, even when you become an elder and those you have submitted to have died, what you do is that you have accountability cycle. Friends that can talk to you in the face. At every point, a man must have authority over him. This is what the devil wants to do to our generation. And this is why God is afraid of anointing us. God is afraid. And this is why I'm sharing this. I'm not sharing this to glorify anybody. I'm careful not to call people's names. I called God's servant's name by mistake because I just wanted to tell you what he told me. But I'm telling you this God is afraid of anointing our generation. The things we are doing, imagine if one apostle in Nigeria can fill the stadium and raise 10 cripples. Imagine what will happen. Why do you think those things are not happening? We have prayed to the level of being able to raise cripples. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. More than 10 in one meeting. We have revelation enough to be able to raise cripples over 10 in one meeting. We have enough consecration. Listen, if I tell you the consecration that some of the apostles I know keep, you will shout. But with the revelation, 
with the prayer power, with the consecration, God has withdrawn authority. Because he knows until a generation comes under full authority, that generation is a threat to what God wants to achieve. And so if we don't honor authorities and submit, our generation may pass without power. Go and listen to the men that wrought wonders in the days of old. What did they preach? What did they preach? I have followed men. What did they preach? No special revelation. But God was always there. Remember, in Mark 16, 20, he said, the Lord walking with them, confirming the world with signs. <laughs> and sometimes you, you find these people talking. You can literally sense bitterness. You can literally, you can sense envy. You can sense jealousy because they don't have what it takes. For a man to correct the body, there are three credentials he must have. Number one is love. If you don't love the body, you can't correct the body. The Bible says, speaking the truth in love. When you find people speaking in bitterness, in sentiment, in envy, just shut your ears out. Before you know, bitterness will enter your soul. Number two, you cannot speak the truth except as you are speaking in faith. So when you find people who speak the truth, they say it in faith. The boldness is by the spirit. It's not based on intelligence. It's not based on research. I have studied and then they are talking, you are seeing pride, born out of eloquence and mental prowess. That's not what authorizes you to speak over the body of Christ. There is a faith, operation of faith that moves in your soul to be able to bring counsel by time. If that spirit of faith is not at work, you can't address the body. And number three, a man who addresses the body of Christ. Are you following? This is not my conventional style, but bear with me. I'm trying to fight something. There's a beast of reckless wickedness that is trying to enter the body of Christ. And if we don't speak like this, by the mercy of God, God has opened the heart of youth to listen to some of us. And so it's our responsibility to correct them from certain things. So they know why we do what we do. We don't honor fathers just because we want to create impression. We know the danger. If we don't honor those who have gone ahead of us, we cannot receive the promise. He said, be a followers of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. You don't follow them, you can't obtain the promise. Number two, if we don't follow them or honor them, we can never be accurate. When power comes, when influence comes, lawlessness will enter our soul. Full of faith and you must be full of understanding to be able to talk to the body of Christ. And so, one of the things that is stopping us from walking in the tangible dimension of the anointing is dishonor. As simple as this thing sounds, this is why we are not empowered. And the reason God will not anoint us is because if he does, then it's a breach of the law of inheritance. If he does, we will become rebels and lawless people. And the impact and effect after a long time will be devastating. And number three, the reason God insists on honor before the anointing is because spiritual things are a dynasty. You can trace Jesus back to Adam. Nobody just appears. We are a lineage in the spirit. Nobody appears. We are a lineage. That's why when you find a man, you can trace his history in the spirit. You can trace him. Because we are a lineage. The same way you have physical genealogy, you also have spiritual genealogy. And if you study the genealogy of Jesus, it was not biological. Because Rahab had nothing to do in Jesus' biological family tree. It's a spiritual genealogy. God cannot truncate the genealogy of the spirit just because he wants to anoint you. 
And when you find a generation that truly honors an anointed, you will discover that it's not just the manifestation of the anointing you will see. The consecration will also be transferred. The discipline will also be transferred. The wisdom will also be transferred. So that that anointing is kept within the boundary of safety. Because anointings don't exist on their own. That's why if you are not connected to a genealogy in the spirit, you can't walk in the anointing. Every anointing have their consecrations. Every anointing have their disciplines. So when you see a man who is anointed, underlining that anointing are disciplines and consecrations that defines the spiritual essence. It's not in our place to rebuke the fathers. When we see errors, we learn from it, we take dressing. How many times have you sat down and called for a family meeting to rebuke your biological father? Before you want to call the body of Christ together to rebuke the fathers. Are you not a hypocrite? If it is not permissible in the natural, who told you it is permissible in the spiritual? May God help us to discern. And what I'm teaching you now, I'm not telling you to go and start lying down for everybody. Everything we do is by discernment. It's by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because not every elder is your father. You have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. To trace you and to lead you to the one you are supposed to come under his government. There are some that will mentor you for a lifetime. There are some that will mentor you for a season. When that season is complete, you will know. And the Holy Ghost will lead you to move forward. And so when your season is accomplished, respectfully, go there, go under that authority, and tell them what God is telling you. And let them release you to go. When Paul was done for Antioch, he said the elders laid hands on them and released them. It may not be a public show, but by all means, receive a release letter. They should tell you you are released, and then you go forward. And if you find people that should train you for a lifetime, no matter how big you are, remain under that government. The day you move, you will become lawless. The day you move, you will be disconnected from inheritance. And the day you move, you will be cut off from a family, a spiritual family and genealogy. I'm telling you this. This is why you find generations rise that have nothing to show for calling on the name of the Lord. They love God, they pray, they serve God, they call the name of Jesus, but they cannot see the impact of their service. They cannot see the impact of calling the name of the Lord. Simple, but these are eternal truths. They are ancient landmarks. Nothing can truncate it. Not even the rise of technology. Number two, which is where I wanted to start. Because this honor thing actually was the least. But probably, that's where God wanted me to start from. You want to be genuinely anointed. The second thing that provokes the release of the anointing is yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. This is actually the first. But I don't know how my teachings went that it became the second. The second thing that provokes the receipt of the anointing is yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. You may not feel emotional tonight, but learn these things I teach you. This will define the next phase of your experience with God. You'll find a man who is genuinely anointed of God. He is thoroughly yielded to the Holy Spirit. I teach it again and again and again. In John chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 4, the Bible gave us four credentials of Jesus. He said, in the beginning was the world. He said, the world was with God and the world was God. The Bible clearly called Jesus God. Number two, he said, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible clearly called Jesus creator. Are you following me? He called him God. He called him creator. Number three, 
It said in him was life. The Bible clearly called him the author of life. And number four, it said that life was the light of man. The Bible called him light. Jesus introduced as God, as creator, as life, and as light. But for 30 years, creator, God, life, light was in Zebulun. Zebulun was in darkness. For 30 years, creator walked amongst men. He was helpless. No blind eye open. No deaf ear open. No cripple walked. No gospel was preached to usher men into the kingdom. Why? His credential was nothing without the enablement of the Holy Spirit. So long as you are putting on flesh, the Holy Ghost must enable you. 30 years later, we will hear Jesus in Matthew 3.15 come to the, the baptismal service of John to be baptized. And John will clearly discern him. You are the son of God. I'm not worthy to unloose the latchet of your sandal. And Jesus said, suffer so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. What was Jesus saying? I acknowledge what you acknowledge. Creation should not baptize creator. I formed you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I am your creator. But this is the route the Holy Ghost is taking. And so for now, even though the law of the Spirit said, the lesser is blessed of the greater, the Holy Ghost has choose an unfamiliar route. And if I must receive the power of the Holy Spirit, I must yield. So he said, suffer it to be so for now. And so John dips him into the water and baptizes him. As he came out, he was praying as he has always prayed. But suddenly the heavens opened and the Holy Ghost came upon him. As if that was not enough, that was one layer. In Matthew 4, 1, the Bible said, the Spirit led him into the wilderness, not to be coronated. He said to be tempted of the devil. Are you seeing the unfamiliar route the Holy Ghost is taking him through? First, the Holy Ghost makes creator to be baptized by creation. And then the Holy Ghost now leads him to be tempted. Meanwhile, Jesus has already taught in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Why would the Holy Ghost be leading you into temptation? The law of yieldedness demands that even when you don't understand, believe. You'll find out why people are not yet anointed. They want to understand everything. They want to understand why God is doing everything. And before they finish understanding one tenth of what God is doing, they are 90 years old. Did you not read that his wisdom and his ways are past finding out? Two things that were outright contradictions, but Jesus understood yieldedness to a fault. You are creator. Go, let creation baptize you. He obeyed. Now, stand up. If you read Mark 1.12, he didn't say he was led. He said he was driven. He was driven to the wilderness. That means the Holy Ghost was almost subjugating his will. He was compelled to the wilderness. And he was told outrightly, you are going to be tempted. But the temptation was not from Satan. The temptation was actually either to yield or not to yield. And when he yielded, hope you know, that's the kind of temptation that God suffers. When he was in Gethsemane, it was a battle of yieldedness. Father, this is not my will. If it were possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. That was the temptation that Jesus suffered. And he was led to the wilderness. And the devil was done tempting him. I thought God would say congratulations. Suddenly, in Luke 4, 14, he said he returned in the power of the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit. That means when yieldedness is accomplished, the byproduct is not congratulation, it's anointing. When you pass the test of yieldedness, God doesn't tell you well done, he anoints you. He didn't return with congratulation, he returned with the power of the Spirit. Suddenly, Jesus that was in the temple for 30 years entered the temple and demons began to scream, get away from us, son of David. Are you just recognizing him? Were you blind? 
Were you blind? The man who went up was a yielded carpenter. The one who came down was the light of God. Because the Bible said the land of Zebulun. It said the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness had seen a great light. The question is, for the first 30 years, what was he? Was he darkness? What was he? He was in darkness, but he didn't have the ability to bring forth light. It was after yieldedness was complete that he began to bring forth light. Most of you think it's because you heard the story of somebody who fasted for 40 days. If you fast for 40 days, you'll be anointed. You will end up with Osa. I'm telling you, I know it by experience. I went to do a test some years ago. They found out the acid content of my stomach. The pH was very low. The acid was so high. And the doctor said, no, with this pH, you should have ulcer. And they went and did a, a, a test on the wall of my stomach. And they discovered I was one of the few lucky people. Because two things happened. When the acid content of your stomach becomes too corrosive, it will abrase the wall of your stomach. It will scrub it. It will corrode it. That's what you call ulcer. But there are few people that instead of corroding it, the wall thickens. And because the wall becomes thicker, instead of having ulcer, they have a thicker intestinal wall. That was what happened to me. If not, I would have been an ulcer patient now. And fasting would have ended for me forever and ever. Still not anointed. I'm telling you, people show up and say, fast for 21 days, you will receive this type of anointing. Fast for 40 days, you will receive this. Go and do it. If you don't come back with Osa, or come back with an encounter with a demon, I assure you, you will come down with pride. And for all your life, you will start preaching how many years you fasted. You don't get anointed by fasting for 40 days. You will get anointed because you are yielded to the Holy Spirit. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can prescribe 40 days fast. The Holy Spirit can prescribe 7 hours tongues for 3 weeks. The Holy Spirit can empty your bank account. Anything he prescribes based on how he made you and the nature of anointing he wants to give you, he will prescribe. Only then will you be anointed. We are not yielded people. We want to fast for 100 days so that when we show up, we'll say, do you know how many days I've fasted? And then only pride and arrogance come out of us, not anointing. When the Holy Ghost leads you, even yourself will know that while you were yet doing it, it was because he helped you. That was why you accomplished it. So you will come out from there, not proud, but broken. And it is in that vent of brokenness that the anointing flows. I'm showing you the things we have lost. Men are following formulas. Men are following stories of other men. And they don't know why they end up going nowhere. A story of a man can inspire you. But only the leadership of the Holy Spirit can empower you. I'm telling you. We are not yielded. This is a generation that wants to fast for 90 days. So that they will put it on their brochure. The moment you open them, you'll see 90 days fast. They want to pray in tongues for three months and put it on their brochure. If God leads you to talk about your exploit, it will encourage somebody, talk about it. But never make the mistake of thinking those things you did in the flesh is the reason why God lifts you. God will lift you to the degree that you obey Him. He will lift you to the degree of your yieldedness because your yieldedness is a testimony of a lack of confidence in flesh. Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 3, we are the circumcision that worships God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. Any man who is genuinely anointed will tell you that the Holy Ghost told me what to do. I did it. I became anointed. When you find a man who traces the anointing to something other than the Holy Spirit, that's not the Holy Ghost. It can be a charismatic expression, not the anointing. And if you want to check it, Either you test the spirit by discernment or you bring real life problem. You will see how helpless he is before those problems. You want to test the spirit? Check him. 
When he's talking, you will sense pride. When he's talking, you will sense bitterness. When he's talking, you will sense competition. Because many times, what took us to the mountain is not God. It's competition. Somebody raised people. So me too, I must raise people. And then you go and fast for 40 days. When you are done carrying out your stunt, come back and start learning from the Holy Spirit. You want to find out why the fathers were anointed? These are the secrets. They were yielded to God. What you read as principles were actually the testimonies of their submission to the Holy Spirit. They did it until it became a life force and they left it as a memorial for generations to come. I'm not discouraging you from prayers. You're strengthening your spirit by praying. I'm not discouraging you from fasting. You, you, you activate the sensitivity of your spirit through fasting. But I am telling you, if it is the anointing of the Holy Ghost you are looking for, the Holy Ghost himself must lead you. If it doesn't drive you, you can never be anointed. When he's done with you, he can choose to give you an encounter or he will send you to a man. And when you meet that man with ease, whether that man likes it or not, you'll be anointed. Hope you know some of the things we receive from men, if they have their way, they won't give us. <laughs> have you not seen men that people receive something from them by mistake? And the thing pains them so much that they want those people to submit their life to them forever and ever and become their slave. Because he pains them. How did this person receive this thing? If they had their way, they would have reserved it for their children 20 years later to give it to them. Now that you have picked it from them, every time they see you doing anything and you don't give them glory, they want to die. Angry and bitter. And you can sense it. That this thing, they didn't give you. You took it. Please sit down, sit down, sit down. Kai, Kai, Kai. Don't trouble my, don't trouble my water. The last thing that makes for a genuine anointing is righteous hunger. I try to choose these words carefully. Righteous hunger. You know, before now, I taught it as, I taught it as hunger. But after a while, the Holy Ghost began to teach me wisdom. And he said, not every hunger is consistent with the will of God. I just give you one example now. Because one person from the fellowship is preaching and they are inviting him. The next person wants to die on the mountain. Because one person prays and two blind eyes open. The next person wants to kill himself with fasting. That's not righteous hunger. That is flesh on rampage. You know what righteous hunger is? It's a hunger for the kingdom of God to go forward. That was what Gideon had. In the days of Gideon, the Midianite enslaved Israel. Judges chapter 6. And Gideon was bodied. He said, where is the God that walked wonders through our fathers? Where is the God that parted the Red Sea? It was not because anybody was doing anything. It was a burden for Israel. And so when you have that kind of hunger, you are permitted to fast and pray. If God sees your consistency, he will appear to you. Because your body is not self-oriented. Let me tell you, one of the operations of the spirit of this age is self-preservation. Find out the foundation of wickedness. The foundation of witchcraft. The foundation of evil is self-preservation. Whether in church or outside the church. When a man is able to conquer flesh and self and begins to fight for the interest of Yahweh. Anything he does can anoint him. And so the reason our generation is not anointed, we don't care about God. We don't care about others. We only care about our reputation. 
We care about influence. We care about fame. Mistakenly accuse a man and see the defense he will bring on the internet to clear his name. Anything that touches our name, we want to die. But what you will know is that if it is God's kingdom you are pursuing, welcome on board. They will harass you, they will accuse you, they will attack you. Don't bother about self-defense. The Lord will be your defense because he is your shield and your exceeding great reward. Only speak when it has to do with God's kingdom. Elijah said, I am terribly vexed. First Kings 19 verse 10. For the Lord God of hosts. For they have killed their prophet. They have destroyed their altar. And there is no more. I'm the only one left. He had bodies for God. When you see men who have hunger for God. Jesus, the only time we saw it as if he lost control. Was when he came to the temple and it was defied. And Jesus showed up, my goodness. You are turning the house of God to a den of wolves and thieves. And he made a cord of many wheat and flogged them out. That is hunger. When a man has have such passion for the things of God, he's about to be anointed. Moses was not concerned about himself. He saw Israel oppressing Egypt, an Egyptian oppressing an Israelite. He pained him to his bones. He killed the Egyptian. That was the body that took him to Horeb. You want to be anointed. Stay with God until he replaces your selfish ambition with the, with the bodies in the heart of the Father. When those bodies come to your heart and you begin to prosecute them in prayer, prosecute them in fasting, you are about to be dangerously anointed. There are certain men, they see the sick in the body of Christ. They can't sleep. Lord, how can we profess your name? Yet so many people are sick. If you will anoint me, Father. If you will anoint me, sickness will be defeated in my generation. God sees it. It's a burden in the heart of God. There are many people that look around and they say, why are so many people godless? Everywhere we turn, there's iniquity. Lord, anoint me. I want to wreck people to the kingdom. Did you not read about Rehard Bonke? He said his ambition in life is to depopulate hell and populate hell. Why will he not gather 10 million people? It was not a self-centered ambition. It was about the kingdom. And when God saw it, God gave him influence. God gave him healing power. God gave him favor with men. Anywhere the guy shows up, whether you are Muslim, Hindu, Christian, regardless of tradition, regardless of belief, regardless of class or pedigree, everybody went to Rehab Bonke's meeting. The anointing was born out of a hunger to see men live hell. When you have such burdens, God is about to anoint you. Why do you think God sent Moses back to Egypt? He was tired of seeing Israel pressed by the Egyptians. You will not see the healing anointing until you are tired of seeing men sick. When you are tired of seeing men sick and it's not a show to you, God can anoint you. And when God genuinely anoints you with the healing oil, the flow and the channel of that anointing will be compassion. When you see the sick, that compassion will flow like a river. Because that was the burden that took you to seeking God. You want souls to be won into the kingdom. God will anoint you with influence and authority. Suddenly, doors will begin to open to you. Your goal is not you want to preach in London. Your goal is not I want to preach in Zambia. Your goal is not I want to preach in Ghana. Your goal is I want to see souls won for the kingdom. And because you are pressing there, a point will come, an anointing that gives you utterance, influence and favor will rest upon you. You will sit in your room. Doors will keep opening. Somebody has thinks it's about flyers and billboards. Somebody has thinks it's about notification on Facebook and YouTube. You will pray and die on the altar. You don't have passion for souls. And you want to be a traveling minister. What do you want to do? You think God has time for your gullible sentiment. Souls are going to hell. You are thinking God should announce you. For the pride of saying the next apostle have shown up. The next prophet is here. This is the next ring had bunking. And then you put a placard online. You are joking. You don't know the kingdom. You want to be anointed? You must find a body in the kingdom. That body must overwhelm you. And you must prosecute that body. When God sees that that body has become the bread on your nose, he will invade you with an anointing you cannot contain. A point will come, you will beg God, reduce your hand. This thing is too heavy. I met a man who had hunger 
for the body to walk in righteousness. God anointed this man with intercessory power. There was a time the man laid on the floor flat for three and a half months. 13 hours every day in intercession. Weeping and crying. His forehead was injured. For many days, his forehead has become black because of where he scrubbed it on the ground. 13 hours every day. But the burden was so much, he didn't even realize he was being injured. If that man enters here now, he can't pray for 10 minutes. He talks for a few minutes, he starts weeping. And as he's crying, suddenly the weight of God's glory will fall in the building. Everybody will start crying. Encounters will begin to happen. I took him to Nsuka for a meeting with some of my friends. I preached the first day. He preached the second day. I had three spots. When I saw him preach, I knew it was a sin for me to preach the third day. Me that they called a fiery preacher. When I saw them, I came up and said, please, all of us need this man to speak to us. I had to give him my slot and sow the seed into his life. Both of us came as ministers. But I saw somebody that carried something that the generation was was lacking. And for those four days, he held us spellbound. He comes to the altar like the wage reviver. As he's weeping, people are coming from the hostels. Some people walked into the meeting. They said Jesus met them on the walkway. Some people came into the meeting. They say a lion, lion appeared and entered into them. And people were coming to the meeting on their own accord. All of us were on the floor weeping. For four days we wept. He didn't pray for more than two hours. Because of the weight that was on his life. Don't let him carry the microphone. You won't know when you will leave your seat and sit down. And start repenting. You won't know when you will leave your seat and sit down. And start begging God to help you. Because there was a weight of glory on his life. That body came because he sought God. And he told God, what is it that you want? And God said, I want men to seek me. Is that all you want? And he sentenced his life. A point came, we gave him invitations. Please, the body of Christ needs to hear you. He said, I'm not released. I would have loved to come and preach. But I'm not released. God will arrest him like Ezekiel. Hope you know Ezekiel will lie down on one side for 390 days. And he will turn to the other side and lie down for 40 days. He was not praying for a car. He was praying for the sins of Israel and Judah. You don't have body for God's kingdom or for God's people and you are looking for anointing. What do you need it for? You want to operate in word of knowledge and in two years you want one soul. What is the word of knowledge for? You are looking for slain in power. And you have not won anybody to the kingdom. What do you think the anointing is meant for? The anointing is meant for advancing the kingdom of God. And only those who have the kingdom of God as their priority are qualified to be anointed. You want to see anointing? There must be honor in your spirit. You want to see anointing? You must be yielded to the Holy Spirit. You want to see anointing? The body for the kingdom must substitute your personal ambition. God doesn't anoint men by mistakes. No, he doesn't. He doesn't anoint men by mistake. It's a deliberate thing. Every man you see who is anointed genuinely is a custodian. You want to pray now? This is the time. Just bend down and talk to the Lord. Some of us truly, truly, what we need to do now is to repent. I'm telling you. Some of us, what we need to do is repent. Our dishonor and arrogance has already disqualified us. We are just not aware. Some of us, our rebellion to the Holy Spirit has already made it impossible for us to be ever anointed. And some of us, our self-centeredness, selfishness, and personal ego and ambition has already disqualified us. If you truly help me, some of us need to repent.
from honoring the fathers. If you like, call it whatever you want. I saw Paul do it in the Bible. I saw many great patriarchs do it in the Bible. In fact, God himself introduced himself after the fathers that have walked before the next generation. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul said, I went to Jerusalem to meet Peter so that I will not have run in vain. If Paul was not looking for relevant by association, then if you like, call it whatever you want. This generation, we will follow those landmarks. I want to pray for you tonight. But before I pray for you, some of you, listen. Some of you, you will need to ask God to help you. You have learned some things unconsciously. And you have done some things not knowing their implications. That's why your efforts are being wasted. You have given, you have emptied your bank account, yet nothing happens. You have fasted for years, nothing happened. You have prayed, nothing happened. And you don't know why. Because you were taught from Facebook and YouTube. By men who don't know God. When we teach you kingdom principles, check. This is why we share some of our testimonies. When you share testimonies, they say you want to create an energy around yourself to manipulate people. When Paul said he went to the third heaven, why don't you go and tell him that? When Paul was talking about his records and credentials, how he was flogged 39 times, how he was in prison, when Paul said, talked about the grace of God that walked through his life. Why didn't you tell him that? When a politician does it, you clap hand. But a pastor shouldn't do it. Why are all of you supporting Peter Obi now? Is it not because of his records and antecedents? How can you follow a man who doesn't have track record? And when a man tells you his dealings with God, you say he's trying to manipulate people. Why not go to Pakistan and come back and use it to manipulate people? If it's easy to risk your life, just for men to clap hands. Why not risk your life a little? Do you know what it means to travel to Kaduna by night? Have you gone to Meduguri before? Have you traveled to preach and you walk through the dead before? Go to Gombe. Go to Meduguri. Go to Sokoto. Travel to the, to the eastern part of, of the world. And stand in public and call oh. Jesus his Lord. When you do that, come back to Facebook. We will hear you. You think we risk our lives to end up coming to talk so that men will clap. It's our life so useless that I will risk my life, leave my wife, leave my son. Most of these meetings we go for, they don't give us honorarium. Is it because we don't talk? Meanwhile, I risk my life to travel in the night. And then when we come to talk about the dealings of God, you say we are looking for applause. Why not risk your life? Abandon your wife and children and come so that they will clap for you on Facebook. What does likes do to my life? And if you think it's Facebook that makes men, why are few, why is it only few men that are made? Talking nonsense. 
Listen. Those of you in this meeting, those online, and those who will hear later on, we don't endorse human worship, and we don't endorse the error of the fathers, but we honor them, because we know they are not perfect. And if we want to attack fathers of faith, let's begin by our own, dealing with our own biological parents. When was the last time you carried your biological parent to internet to analyze? But you pick one general overseer, pick another one. Why not start analyzing your own biological parents and your elders from your village? The wicked ones and analyze them first. And you say others are looking for relevance. What are you looking for? And you find gullible people who know nothing about the kingdom talking. You want to ask the Lord tonight to help you. Perhaps you have made a mistake. Ask him to help you. And then we will pray Tonight, for God to genuinely put his hand on men. Genuinely. Genuinely. Listen, we make mistakes. I told you, I'm a young man. I'm already making mistakes. So I will be foolish to think a father who has served for 50 years has not made errors that himself is ashamed of. And when I call somebody, I don't endorse him. I don't even have the stature to endorse him. That's number one. It will be pride to think I'm endorsing a father. Number two, I don't worship any man. And if there's anybody who is worshiping a man, he should be pointed out and condemned. And I will be the first to stand against it. However, you cannot lure a generation to dishonor the fathers. And in the same vein, if you are not yielded to the Holy Spirit, or you are not carrying the burden of the kingdom, don't dream of an anointing. No one will come on you. Tonight, you want to ask the Lord to help you. I may not call us out. We are out of time. Just place your hand on your chest. For some of you, it's dishonor. For some of you, it's lack of yieldedness. And for some of you, it's self-centeredness. And just in case you are here, you are not repenting, but you have never asked Jesus to become the Lord of your life. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. What we are talking about here, you don't even know it. It's alien to you. If you are in the category who needs to give your heart to Jesus, I want you to come out. But for those of you who are already born again, but you are making it right with God, place your hands on your chest. We don't have time. So I'm dealing with these two categories. If you have not said, Jesus, become the Lord of my life. I told you, only God anoints men. Jesus, the Son of God. You want to come out? Come quickly. I don't want to mix it up. I see a lot of people already with their hands on their chest. Praise God. Everybody is born again. Now go ahead and tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Hear this. I want to tell the Lord to touch at least seven people as a sign. And then I will call our Father Bishop will be to come and pray over us and release a heavenly, a fatherly blessing. But you have asked for mercy and God is about to touch people. I will lay hands on these ones, but it's a sign that God has said our prayers and God will anoint people from this conference. I don't want you to be very rowdy, but right now, Holy Spirit, the men you have prepared tonight to touch. The ones you want to pour a fresh oil on. The ones that are earmarked as a first fruit of this operation. Whether they are here on ground or online, I speak now. Let the hand of God come upon them mightily. Seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Take! I shall bring them quickly. Hear me? Somebody has a growth in the body that is still dematerialized now. There's a growth around your breast. It's been, it's melting now. You can check your body. You discover the growth is gone. Check now. 
There is a growth that is dematerializing now. I just picked it in my spirit. Please, anybody finds out that something that looks like a lump has melted. Can you wave at me? Please check your body. I just speak that now. I have not prayed. But I guess that was a body in your heart that God wants to address. It's like a pain, a painful substance or something in somebody's... You have, hey, help the sister. She just lifted her hands and the power of God is on her. Bring her here. Bring her here, please. At this point, just bring her towards the front. She just lifted her hands and the power of God took her down. He would help us come and Please hear this. It's not difficult for God to anoint a man. But there are postures you take to be able to receive the anointing. And so the things I taught you tonight are postures of the spirit that are made for the receipt of the anointing. Number one is the posture of honor. Number two is the posture of yieldedness. And number three is the posture of service or body. You don't have these three postures, forget it. The anointing is not for you. In that spirit of reverence and expectation, as solemn as everyone is now, let's receive our Father, Bishop Obi, to please speak a word of blessing so that this generation can be shifted. Please be sensitive and keep your heart open. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that He died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayer, please send I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also, if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.